United States of America, Appley, v. Anthony Sparrow, Defendant Appellant Joseph Beseda, also known as Quadif, Christopher Lavate, also known as Chris A.M., Robert Patterson, Joseph Pontecorvo, also known as Joe Pont, Michael Pontecorvo, also known as Michael Pont, Joseph Benanti, Charles Calco, Joseph Calco, Fabrizio de Francisi, also known as Fabrizio, Joseph Delatore, also known as Little Joey, Christian Ludwigson, also known as Chris Pacello, also known as Binger, Michael Yamine, James Calandra, William Galloway, Defendants, 331F.3D57, 2D Sir 2003, Annotate This Case U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, 331F.3D57, 2D Sir 2003, Argued, February 12, 2003 Decided, May 20, 2003 Amended, May 29, 2003 John W. Mitchell, New York, New York, for Defendant Appellant, Greg D. Andres, Assistant United States Attorney, David C. James, Assistant United States Attorney, of Counsel, Roslyn R. Mauskopf, United States Attorney, on the brief, United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, Brooklyn, New York, for Appley, before, Cabrains and F.I. Parker, Circuit Judges, and Kaplan Asterisk District Judge, Jose A. Cabrains, Circuit Judge, after a jury trial in the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York, Edward R. Corman, Chief. Judge, Defendant Anthony Sparrow was found guilty on a one-count indictment of conspiracy to commit racketeering, in violation of the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO, 18 U.S.C. 1962, d. The government presented evidence from which the jury determined that Sparrow, while conducting the affairs of the Bonanno organized crime family, conspired in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1962, d to engage in at least two of five specifically enumerated racketeering acts prohibited by 18 U.S.C. 1962, c., namely three murders, management of an illegal gambling enterprise, and loan sharking. The jury returned a verdict of guilty on April 5, 2001. Sparrow filed a motion for a judgment of acquittal under federal RCRIM P-29, c., on August 23, 2001, asserting, inter alia, 1, that the loan RICO conspiracy count under which he was tried and convicted was barred by the five-year statute of limitations and, two, that the indictment under which he was charged was insufficiently specific. The district court held oral argument on that motion on December 14, 2001 and rejected Spiro's claims in an unpublished order dated April 15, 2002. The court stated only the following, the motion is denied. The statute of limitations argument on which the oral argument focused is foreclosed by Second Circuit precedent. CEG US v Salerno, 868F.2D 524, 534, 2D Sir 1989. The remaining grounds are without merit. The court sentenced Sparrow primarily to life in prison and entered a final judgment on April 19, 2002, on appeal. Sparrow renews the two claims described above. We affirmed in a summary order filed February 28, 2003, which we hereby withdraw. We now publish this opinion in its place. Sparrow contends that the loan RICO count under which he was tried and convicted was barred by the five year statute of limitations governing RICO prosecutions. C 18 U.S.C. 3282, an O person shall be prosecuted, tried, or punished for any offense not capital, unless the indictment is found, within five years next after such offense shall have been committed. The original indictment in this case was returned on May 25, 1999. Thus, in order for this prosecution to fall within the five-year limitations period, the RICO conspiracy charged must have continued at least through May 25, 1994. In the sixth superseding indictment, under which Sparrow was ultimately tried, the Government alleged that Sparrow, while conducing the affairs of the Bonanno organized crime family, conspired in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1962, d. to engage in five specifically enumerated racketeering acts prohibited by 18 U.S.C. 1962, c. It is uncontested that racketeering acts hashtag 2 to 5 charged in the indictment, which acts consist of three murders and conspiracy to participate in an illegal gambling enterprise, 
were all completed by the end of 1993. With respect to Racketeering Act No. 1, the government charges that Sparrow engaged in a conspiracy to make and collect extortionate extensions of credit between January 1983 and May 1999.1 This allegation, if proven, would bring the charged conduct within the limitations period. Sparrow asserts, however, that the government failed to prove that any of his loan sharking activities, which were primarily associated with an illegal gambling enterprise that folded in December 1993, took place on or after May 25, 1994. The district court held that Spiro's arguments were precluded by our precedent in United States v. Salerno, 868F.2D524, 534, 2D Sir 1989, which in turn relied on United States v. Persico, 832F.2D705, 713 14, 2DCIR. 1987, the court understood these cases to stand for the proposition that once the government established that Sparrow continued to act as a member of the Bonanno organized crime family after May 25, 1994, the RICO conspiracy with which he was charged was deemed to have operated after that date as well, regardless of when Racketeering Act No. 1 took place. Sparrow, however, asserts that the district court misapprehended these precedents. His counsel maintained at oral argument before the district court that the view of the law ultimately adopted by that court is untenable because it would mean that once you joined an organized crime family, the conspiracy would continue in perpetuity until you left the family, and that's not what a RICO conspiracy is. TR of Oral ARG, December 14, 2001, at 71 to 72 assuming without deciding that Spiro's statute of limitations claim was properly raised in the district court too it is unnecessary to determine whether the district court correctly interpreted Persico and Salerno because as we explained below we hold that Sparrow has failed to rebut the presumption that the loan sharking conspiracy charged in racketeering act number no. one continued past May 25, 1994 accordingly Spiro's prosecution was timely because Racketeering Act No. 1 is presumed to have continued past May 25, 1994. Several of our sister circuits have held that where a conspiracy statute does not require proof of an overt act, as 18 U.S.C. 1962, D, does not, and W here a conspiracy contemplates a continuity of purpose and a continued performance of acts, it is presumed to exist until there has been an affirmative showing that it has been terminated, comma, and its members continue to be conspirators until there has been an affirmative showing that they have withdrawn. United States v. Mays, 512F.2D637, 642, 6th Sir 1975, emphasis added, quoted in United States v. Maloney, 71F.3D645, 660, 7th Sir 1995, and United States v. L. Well, 984 F.2D 1289, 1293, 1st Sir 1993, c. Also United States v. Gonzalez, 921 F.2D 1530, 1548, 11th Sir 1991. We agree. Cf. Example United States v. Flaherty. 295 F.3D 182, 192, 2D Sir 2002, holding, where an overt act is required, that a conspiracy is presumed to continue until the last overt act, United States v. Diaz, 176 F.3D 52, 98, 2D Sir 1999, same. The generalized loan sharking activity alleged in Racketeering Act No. 1 is Precisely the type of activity that contemplates a continuity of purpose and a continued performance of acts. Maloney, 71F.3D at 660. Indeed, we have previously noted that acts of extortion and illegal debt collection inherently exude a pattern and a threat of continuing criminal activity. United States v. Minicone, 960F.2D 1,109, 2D Sir 1992. Accordingly, once the government met its burden of proof by establishing that the loan sharking conspiracy existed, it was entitled to a presumption that the conspiracy continued until defendant demonstrated otherwise.
The burden shifted to Sparrow to prove affirmatively that the loan sharking conspiracy alleged in Racketeering Act No. 1 was terminated before May 25, 1994, or that he withdrew from the conspiracy prior to that date, in order to sustain his statute of limitations claim. See Flaherty, 295F.3D at 192, holding that where the government has shown that a conspiracy existed. It is the defendant's burden to prove that the conspiracy was terminated or that the defendant took affirmative steps to withdraw. Sparrow thus had to prove either, 1, that the objectives of the conspiracy were accomplished prior to May 25, 1994 or, 2, that he abandoned the conspiracy prior to that date. See Persico, 832F.2D at 713, holding that a RICO conspiracy continues until the objectives of the conspiracy are either accomplished or abandoned, see also United States v. Rastelli, 870F.2D 822, 838-2D Sir 1989, same. With respect to the first of these possible showings, because the alleged objective of the conspiracy was an open-ended attempt to extort money through loan sharking, Sparrow needed to present evidence from which the jury could have found that the goals of the conspiracy were accomplished in some final manner. Although Sparrow attempts to frame the loan sharking acts alleged in Racketeering Act No. 1 as limited exclusively to actions taken in connection with an illegal gambling enterprise that folded in 1993, the indictment is not so limited. See Note 1, Ante. The fact that the gambling enterprise folded in 1993 is insufficient to establish that Spiro's loan sharking activities were complete as of that date, given the allegations in the indictment, which do not link his alleged loan sharking activities to the illegal gambling enterprise. With respect to the second showing, Sparrow produced no evidence that he affirmatively renounced the goal of extorting money through loan sharking. To the contrary, the evidence presented at trial would tend to support the opposite conclusion namely, that he never renounced the goals of the loan sharking conspiracy. In the absence of proof that the goals of the loan sharking conspiracy alleged in Racketeering Act No. 1 were achieved in a final manner or that Sparrow abandoned the conspiracy, the conspiracy must be presumed to have continued past May 25, 1994, thereby bringing the indictment within the statute of limitations. Two constitutionally deficient indictment claim Sparrow also asserts that he should be acquitted because the indictment in which he was charged was constitutionally deficient. More specifically, he claims that the government's charge with respect to Racketeering Act No. 1, which alleged only a generic conspiracy to make extortionate extensions or collections of credit, Sparrow BR at 43, was insufficiently specific to apprise him of the charges against him, because this claim was not raised prior to trial as unambiguously required by the law of the circuit, see United States v. Crowley, 236 F.3 D 104, 2000, the claim must be rejected. In Crowley, we explained that, in accordance with Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 12, b. 2, any challenge to an indictment must be brought prior to trial because the mandate of Rule 12, b. 2, is no mere pleading technicality. Rather, it serves a number of important purposes, including deterrence of gamesmanship Rule 12, b. 2, prevents a defendant from deciding whether to object to an indictment's purported lack of specificity based solely on whether he is convicted or acquitted and ensuring that indictments are not routinely challenged and dismissed after the jury has been seated and sworn, a result that would waste jurors' time and force courts frequently to confront complex double jeopardy questions. ID at 108. Mindful of the concerns identified in Crowley, we decline to examine Spiro's challenge to the specificity of the indictment in the instant case. If Spiro had been truly concerned that the lack of specificity in the indictment would prejudice his defense, he could have raised an objection prior to trial, at which point the district court could have dismissed the indictment if it was indeed deficient, leaving the door open for more narrowly defined criminal charges to be brought in the future. But at this late stage of the proceedings after Spiro's trial has begun, and, indeed, ended, if we were to entertain and accept his claim that his indictment was constitutionally deficient, we would have to dismiss the indictment, paving the way for a new trial. See United States v. Scott, 437 U.S. 82, 98 SCT 2187, 57 L.E.D. 2D 65, 1978, holding that double jeopardy concerns are not implicated when counts in.
an indictment are dismissed during trial, even after the jury has been empaneled and sworn. The result would be a judicial condonation of gamesmanship and sharp practice that would unfairly give defendant two chances to obtain a verdict of acquittal and would waste precious judicial resources. Such a strategy of sandbagging the district court cannot be tolerated. C.F. Jarvis v. Ford Motor Co. 283F.3D33, 62, 2D Sir 2002, discussing the problem of sandbagging, United States v. Male Juvenile, 121F.3D34, 39, 2D Sir 1997, same. We noted in Crowley that a failure to raise a challenge to an indictment prior to trial may be excused upon a showing of cause for failure to raise the claim and prejudice. Crowley, 236 F.3D at 110 and N8. Sparrow has offered no reason why he did not raise his insufficiency of the indictment claim prior to trial. Accordingly, he has not shown cause for his failure to challenge his indictment prior to trial, and his claim must be rejected. Point three asterisk 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 we have considered all of the defendant's arguments and find them to be without merit. For the reasons set forth above, the judgment of the district court is hereby affirmed. Asterisk the Honorable Louis A. Kaplan, of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, sitting by designation one Racketeering Act No. 1 is described in the indictment as follows, 16 The defendant Anthony Sparrow agreed to the commission of the following acts, either one of which alone constitutes Racketeering Act 1, a conspiracy to make extortionate extensions of credit 17 in or about and between. January 1983 and May 1999, both dates being approximate and inclusive, within the Eastern District of New York and elsewhere, the defendant Anthony Sparrow, together with others, knowingly and intentionally conspired to make extortionate extensions of credit, in violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 892B Conspiracy to Collect Extensions of Credit by Extortionate Means 18 in or about and between January 1983 and May 1999, both dates being approximate and inclusive, within the Eastern District of New York and elsewhere, the defendant Anthony Sparrow, together with others, knowingly and intentionally conspired to participate in the use of extortionate means to collect and attempt to collect extensions of credit, in violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 894A, 1. United States v. Sparrow, Number 99 CR 520, superseding indictment S6, IRC, EDNY. 2. A statute of limitations claim presents an affirmative defense that is not cognizable on appeal unless properly raised below. United States v. Walsh, 700 F.2D 846, 855 56, 2D Sir 1983. With respect to the question of when a claim is properly raised below, we held in United States v. Grammaticos, 633 F.2D, 1013, 2D Sir 1980, that W here the defense of time bar, is squarely interposed, it must be submitted to a properly instructed jury for adjudication, ID at 1022. Similarly, in Walsh, we noted with disapproval that no objection was taken to the trial court's failure to give such an instruction to the jury. Walsh, 700 F.2D at 855. Because the defendant in this case raised his statute of limitations defense in this case only after the trial was over, and therefore did not allow the court even to consider a jury instruction on the limitations question, there is a strong argument that Spiro's statute of limitations claim should be considered waived, or at least forfeited. See United States v. Kelly, 147 F.3D 172, 177, 2D Sir 1998, holding that waiver applies to a defendant's failure to raise a statute of limitations defense in the district court, Walsh, 700 F.2D at 855, same, Grammaticos, 633 F.2D at 1022-23 stating that a statute of limitations defense is waived where no request for a jury instruction on the issue is made, but also undertaking a plain error forfeiture analysis. We do not reach this question. 3. In his reply brief, Sparrow also asserts that the government engaged in a constructive amendment of the indictment of this case, which is a per se violation of the Fifth Amendment requiring reversal of the conviction. Sparrow Representative BR at 1-10 
because this claim was not raised in the district court or in defendant's main appellate brief, and because no plain error is apparent, we will